to see you in the house of the Lord. It's always good to walk in the Lord's house and be able to feel his presence. Amen. Amen. I truly believe that the Lord is here tonight. I thank God for his spirit. Amen. Thank God for you, his people that have gathered here tonight for Bible study. Amen. Amen. I, I don't, you know, to just say Bible study it seems to be like a, a, a failing art in the eyes of some. You know, some, you know, there are some churches that don't even have uh, midweek service anymore. They only have Sunday service. But, you know, I mean, most of us will tell you we cut our teeth. You know, in Bible studies, that's when we learn about God. We learn how to worship, how to praise, how to study God's word, and how to live as Christians in Bible study. Amen. So I, I'm just going to encourage us to continue to keep seeking the Lord, keep coming to Bible study, and uh, just keep trying to be all that we can be in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me take a moment to thank Pastor Shepherd for another opportunity to stand here and minister the word of God. Um, it's great to be a part of this church, a part of this ministry. Uh, do we have a perfect church? Absolutely not. Amen. When you find the perfect church, it's probably time for you to leave. Amen. Because, amen, somebody said that. <laughs> but there is no perfect church. Amen. But I do believe that we are among uh, people of God that love the Lord, who have our hearts in the right place, and we're just trying to make it to heaven. Amen. Amen. I want to call your attention tonight uh, to the word of God from the book of Matthew Amen. The 13th chapter. Thank God for my wife here tonight. Appreciate her. And uh, Matthew, the 13th chapter and verse number 45 and 46. Now, this little, this little passage of scripture here, you know, uh, parables that Jesus is talking about. And it's Jesus himself talking. And he's talking about uh, what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he goes through a, a number of parables here, but I want to focus on this parable that he uh, talks about in uh, the 13th chapter. It starts at verse number 45, and it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he has found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Amen? So from that uh, scripture tonight. I just want to teach a little bit from this this thought. Uh, it's time to sell. Amen. It's time to sell. Let's go before the Lord Father. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you for your people that have gathered here tonight. I pray, God, that you help me, Lord God. Anoint me, Lord God. Help me, God, to minister your word tonight. God, let all flesh be silent. Let your spirit be glorified in this place. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, we, we live in different times. And that, that's an understatement. And if you don't think the times are changing, then, then you, you're living under a rock. And you need to get out more because the times is changing. The world is changing. And, you know, so many things are happening. And, and they seem to be happening just on a reoccurring basis. You know, people don't value life anymore. Uh, just, just today I was uh, listening to the radio and I just uh, came across the news that there was a, a, a mass shooting in, in uh, Pennsylvania. And, and, you know, you hear about these things so much now that they don't even make the major news anymore. You know, we, we've become kind of callous to them. And, and it, there's just something missing in our world, amen. The, the, the feeling, the love, the the, the 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 honor and respect for human beings is just diminished in our love and in our world. And so, it, it begs the question: What are we looking for? What are we missing? And when I, I came across this text, you know, the Lord dropped this in my spirit a few days ago, and. He said that the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man. And I want to read that just a little bit more. Listen to this now. He said, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Now, uh, the merchant man, obviously, he's a man that sea. And he's got the whole sea. He's got a vast sea 
that he's searching through, trying to find something of value. And it's like people in, gen in general, all of us are looking for something. People die and give up their lives looking for something. People, when, when, they, feel, when they feel that they can't, uh, they get to a certain point and they feel like there's nothing else to, to uh, what's the word, to, to, uh, to reach for. Or, or to, 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 that's not the word I'm looking for. It, 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 to, they're trying, they, they come to a point and they, find, they can't find any motivation or any drive, any aspirations to reach for anything further. Because they get to a point where they feel like, like this is it, life has failed, and I should just give up. But saints of God, that's not the end. I and mean, God always has a way for us. The problem is we're looking for the wrong things to satisfy us. We're looking for peace and joy and love in the wrong things. The things that we're looking to satisfy us, you see, this body that we are in, this body that we are in, it, it, it's a soul inside of this body. Amen. And remember how that soul got there. God breathed into Adam's nostril and he became a living soul. So a part of God was put inside of him. And there's a part of, of us as human beings that only God can satisfy. No matter what we reach for in this world, no matter what we obtain, no matter what we accomplish and what we have, there's a part of us that only God can satisfy. And there are so many people who are confused in our world today because they're trying to find satisfaction in other things. Hallelujah. And so this merchant man it's like many of us. He's on a vast sea trying to find something that's going to satisfy him. And then he happens upon what the Bible refers to as a goodly pearl. Now I want you to imagine a vast sea. Now, I've been out on the Chattahoochee a couple times. And to me, that's, that's, that's pretty, that's big enough for me. You know, to this day, I'm, well, don't worry about how old I am. Well, I just, I just turned 53 last week. And, 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 and I've never been on a cruise. Because I can't drink all that water. And, and it's, a, it's a lot of water. But this man is out there searching the sea for one cuddly pearl. It's like us in the world. We're trying to find any and everything to satisfy us. And, but he happens to, I don't know what led him there. What, how, how did he get to that spot? I wonder if he had, you know, sonar equipment. You know, what led him to, to that spot? What, what, made, what kind, well, they obviously didn't have sonar equipment back there. But whatever the latest technique he had back then led him to this particular spot. I got a, uh, one of my best friends, he, he's a fisherman. And in the past, we, we talk every morning, and in the past, I'm going to say three to four months, he spent nearly eleven, twelve thousand dollars on his electronics on his boats. Not the boat. The fish finding equipment. And I'm like, what? Yeah, he said, well, how, why, why, why? He said, because this is going to help me compete with the big boys. Because fish finders show you where the fish are. 
you driving up in the boat, and, you, and, and it's, it's pretty cool, how it works. There's a little screen right there. There's a whole bunch of them right here. That ain't going to help you catch them, but it'll tell you where they are. <laughs> and so I, I, I think about this merchant man, and, and what, how did he get to this spot? That he found this one thing. And when he found it, Brother Wilson, the Bible said it was so good to him. Now, obviously, this man's a merchant man. So he's got stuff already. You're not a poor man if you're a merchant man. Out on, on the, you, you, you got, first of all, you got a boat. Huh? You, you got to have all, all the, the, the paraphernalia that come along with being a boater and a fisherman. And so he's not a man of meager means. But he found something that he thought was so valuable that he went home and said, this is my last day fish. This is my last day being a merchant man. I'm going into retirement. I'm hanging it up because I found something that's going to satisfy all my needs. And I'm selling everything I've got. I'm, I'm, I'm pushing all the chips in on the table. And I'm going to bet on this one thing. Saints of God, what this parable is telling us is that Jesus Christ is the only thing that you can actually count on. It is the one thing that's worth selling everything else. It's worth giving up everything else if you can just find a relationship with him. I'm talking about a true relationship. Saints of God, if you have a true relationship with God, you are growing in your faith. If you're not growing in your faith, something is wrong. It's a shame for us to be in church all of these years and have the same old mean spirit, the same old bad attitude, the same old can't hug anybody, can't tell anybody you love them. Been coming to church all these years and not making any growth, just marking time. That's not why God saved us. You ought to be growing up in the Lord. You ought to be in the point, at the point at some point in time where, where folks treat you wrong and they do stuff to, to, to aggravate you where you just love them anyway. I've been serving God long enough that I'm not going to allow you to upset my spirit. Y'all help me. Don't let me get in trouble now. I got to. Give this over to Bedal at 825. Listen, are you growing in your relationship with God? Because if you haven't reached a point where you say, I'm ready to sell everything, I'm ready to give up everything, you're not growing. You're not growing. But some of us, we come, we, we come in with our, you know, with our, this is how I am. You know, I, at the, uh, we were at NAYC, and one of the things, probably one, not, maybe one of, this is one of my highlights throughout the whole conference. Uh, but one of the brothers got up there, he was preaching, and he talked about, bend me, Lord. He, he talked about, you know, telling God to bend me and to break. In other words, God, whatever you need to do, if you need to bend me, break me, whatever you need to do to get me in the place where you can use me, bend me, Lord. Bend me, Lord, because I've come in with my own agenda. There are things that in my mind that I think that I should, it should be this way. Or, or this is just me, or this is just, no, 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 no. God, I want to, you see, I've experienced me enough. Me has not gotten me anywhere. I need God in my life to help me rid myself of me. Because I need him. 
I want to be in that place where the scripture says it's no more I but Christ that lives inside of me. In him I move, I live, and I have my being. And in order for that to happen, saints of God, there are some things that we're going to have to say, Lord, bend me in this area. Because I can't grow unless you bend me. But some of us are still searching. We're still at sea. Looking for something that... The, here's, a, here's, here's, here's what has happened to our world. Those of us who are... And, and have, I, I remember saying something similar to this uh, in a lesson not too long ago. Each generation looks back at the, the older generation looks back at the younger generation and say, oh, they had it all, they're, they're confused, they had it all wrong, you know. Because they're wiser and they're smarter, smarter the younger generation says, hey, y'all, y'all work harder, we're working smarter. And where was I going with that? Anyway, it'll come back to me. <laughs> but... <laughs> But the, help me, Jesus. <laughs> 53, oh yeah, 53. <laughs> 53. <laughs> Lord, help me. What has happened to this generation? It came back to me. I had a senior moment. <laughs> Is that you see, I, I, I just, you can't get mad at me if I preach it by myself. So, you know, I grew up in a house. There were six boys in there. No girls. My mom was primarily the one who worked most of the time. My daddy uh, didn't have, like, he, he worked. He just didn't have, like, a steady job. He did different odds and end jobs. But my mom was primarily the, the breadwinner for us. And I, I remember, like, seeing some of her checks. Back in the day, I, I think she made like maybe two hundred or something dollars a week or something like that. Hey, y'all looking at me like, well, yeah, yeah. But we, we had clothes, we we had food. She, people thought we had stuff we didn't have. But more than anything, in those days. We knew about God. In those days, conditions were created that forced us to pray. It forced the people of God to pray. You needed miracles. You had to have God perform miracles in order for you to stay alive. This generation, it's the Laodicean generation. They are rich with good and have need of nothing. Of nothing. My, my daughter's not in here. The, the girl don't have chores. They don't, they, this generation, they don't have chores. We've made it so good for them. And I'm not picking on her, but in general, this society has it so good. God has blessed us so good that we have fell in love with the blessings and left out the one who blesses us. And what happens to this generation is when the blessing leaves, you're ready to lose your mind. Because you don't know the source of the blessing. But see, if you would get a hold of God and establish a relationship with him, you will realize that even when you lose 
what you thought was your blessing, you don't have to worry about it because you have a connection with the one that has the ability to bless you over and over and over again. So, I know this guy. I've been talk, I talk to him a lot. He's pretty close to me. And he, he had a job, okay? And he moved from one job to another job. And he worked there for about maybe two years or so. And he said, man, I hate this job. And he was, he was in, you know, in a, in a contract situation where he had to work there for a certain amount of time. And he was telling me, he says, man, as soon as my obligation is over, I'm out of here. I'm like, hey, man, the job market's hard. I don't care. I'll find something. I'm out of here. As soon as I said, okay, fine. And as soon as his contract was over, he was out of there. Found another job. <laughs> I don't know who was happier, them or him. And so he found this other job. Well, you know, he applied for a couple different ones. And he applied for this one, and he got this job, making more money. And he says, I'm starting in, in, you know, seven days or whatever, whatever. And he says, but if this other job calls me, I'm leaving them. I was like, come on, man. I said, you, you can't do that, man. So you, you, these folks just hired you. They're going to take you through the process and spend all that time in HR and get you hooked up and you know, get you in this job and you're just going to leave after a week or two? He said, I don't care what you say. This other job, this is the premier job in the city. He said, this is where you want to be. If they call me, I'm gone. They'll find somebody else the same way they found me. And I started thinking about that thing. I said, no, he got a point. He said, it's just a job. I'm going to go someplace where <laughs> I was conflicted with it, as you can see. I was conflicted with the whole thing because it's okay. You, how are you going to leave and, because that's not my ultimate goal? I, 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 don't, I don't understand. Maybe y'all help me. Some people say, well, it's a stepping stone. It's, a, it, it's however you want to look at it. But, but his explanation to me was that, listen, I'm not going to stay here when I can be here. He said, because, you know, and when you look at it in the big scheme of things, if these people needed to replace me, they would replace me and wouldn't think twice about it. But I'm looking out for what, what, what I know my potential is and where I could be. Now, you could do with that how, what you want to do with it. But a part of me is thinking, yeah, man. Go where you're going to get your best potential. Go where you're going to succeed. And so when I look at that and I, and I kind of juxtapose that with the scripture that, that I read here, it's like, am I going to be comfortable? What is going to keep me here in a place or what am I tied to here that's going to keep me from moving higher? Oh, God. Am I growing? Let's, let's come back to church. Let's leave the job stuff alone. <laughs> am I growing? I've been at, here's the point I'm really trying to make. I've been at this level for way too long. When I know I have the potential in God to be here. And I'm discovering that the only thing that's keeping me from moving, that's keeping me from moving from here to here, 
is me. I can't point the blame at anybody else. If I'm not growing in God, it's something that I'm not doing. And so back to the job guys coming together now. He's looking at where I'm not, he's saying I'm not concerned about these companies because they're not concerned about me. I'm concerned with reaching my potential. Now back to church. I've been here long enough hearing about how God uses this one and that one and that one to do this one. God, why can't you use me? The only thing that's stopping God from using you is you. You've got to grow in the Lord. But the only way to grow, change has to happen. My time is almost gone. I, I was downtown, or uptown, whatever they call it, Columbus, uh, this past week. And down there in the, the historic district, and I saw all of these bugs. They were like stuck on the side of houses. And I looked at these things and I was like, man, why do these bugs crawl up on the side of the house and just die like that? And I kept looking. You know, I'm from South Carolina. I ain't touching nothing. I'm just looking, and these big, they're these big bugs. Then they're just, I mean, they're, I, I, oh, I forgot. I had a picture of it, and I forgot to put it to the sound. But anyway, there, there's pictures. I mean, there's not pictures. I took the pictures of it. There's bugs just all over the sides of the house, all over the fence, and they're dead. And so I'm trying to figure out why these bugs crawl up on the side of the house and die like that. And so I get a little closer and I look at the bug and it's like a skeleton. And my buddy says, that's a cicada. I said, well, why are they die like this on the, they say, oh no. They're not dead. <laughs> what happens with the cicada is, who and this just, I got, I was like, oh Lord, I thank you for a sermon. First of all, they make all kind of rackets. It's the males that make the rackets. And they make the rackets because they're trying to catch the females. They're trying to attract the females. They have like little, I did a whole study on this book though, man. They got little, little, they got little <laughs> stuff in this, inside their stomach. The little wings like thing and they, it's like a drum. And they beat this little drum on the inside of the stomach and it makes a whole lot of racket. And it's like whoever makes the loudest noise is the king. And that's, that's the one that all the female bugs gonna come to. True story. But what happens with the cicadas is when they mature, they come out of their shells. And what's hanging on the side of the house that looks like a dead bug is just a former shell of someone that has a book, something that has grown and moved on. And some of us have been living in the same shell for 10, 15, 5, however many years, and there has no growth happened. But it's time for us to get to that point where we crawl out of that shell and leave that old shell behind and say, God, make me into something new. And whatever I got to get rid of, whatever I got to sell, I'll sell it because I want to be in your favor. Whew. The thing 
thing about the cicada bug is that the shell looks exactly like the bug. Now, when you go out tonight looking for them, <laughs> but it, but saints, it, it's so indicative of what we should be. We should be maturing in the Lord and pulling off that old self and leaving it behind. We should be growing in the Lord and just pulling off that old shell. It looks like you, but that, that ain't me. Come on, somebody. That, that ain't me no more. That, oh, what the scriptures say, and such were some of you, but you are washed. God has changed you. Have you gotten to the point in your relationship with God when you found something that is so good about him that you're ready to give up everything else and say, God, bend me. I'm ready to sell. I'll talk a little bit about Paul before I've got about five minutes. I'll talk about the Apostle Paul before I close. Paul in the book of Philippians Jesus, Jesus. Third chapter, Philippians. Listen to this real quick. Paul says, though I might have, uh, Philippians 3 and 4, though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any other, if any other man thinketh that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Now, he's about to give his, his fleshly qualifications. Okay? He says, Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. So not only am I, I'm, 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 I'm true-blooded Jew, when it comes to the law, I'm a Pharisee, I'm skilled in the law. Concerning zeal, how serious was I about the law of Moses? I persecuted the church. Touching righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. They couldn't find anything on me. But as good as I was, as, as good as a Hebrew as I was, as smart as a, as a Pharisee as I was, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. You know what dung is? Huh? <laughs> he says, I count them as refuse. Who glory? That I, might, that I may win Christ. I give up everything. All of my accolades, all of my brain power, all, all, everything. I, I was the man. But when I found Jesus, who glory, I sold it all. Why? I said, bend me, Jesus. That's what Paul is saying here. Ooh, let's go a little bit further, and I'm going to close. I've got about three minutes. Yea, doubtless, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb that I might win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Not having my own righteousness which is in the law. Well, this is the way I do it. Okay, next step. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Change me, Lord. 
I'll sell everything I have. I just want to serve you. When you found that goodly pearl, you searched the sea, this whole vast sea, this whole world, and you found something as good as Jesus Christ. Give up everything else and follow him. Let's stand together. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God bless you tonight. I hope this has encouraged you to grow in the Lord. Stop being stagnant. Stop. If you, if, you, if you don't know if you're stagnant or not, you're probably stagnant. Find something you can do. I need to grow in the Lord. I want to do more for God. I want God to be manifested in my life. I want people to know that I serve him when I walk down the streets. I want people to notice that I'm a child of God. Who? Yes, yes. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this night, God. I thank you for your people. God, I thank you for your word. Help us tonight, God. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.